So I'm going to talk to you today about random events in economic contexts. Mostly I'm going to focus on random events in the labor market. I think those are the ones that are in many ways the most interesting, uh, but some of them will be beyond the labor market. And let, let me t uh, start with a story about my favorite fiction author. His name is Elmore Leonard. Uh, are there any Leonard fans in the room? Uh, He's not nearly as widely known and appreciated as I feel he ought to be. Uh, he's not for everybody, uh, but sentence by sentence, it's hard to find anybody who does it better than he does it. Uh, and in particular, he's really good at dialogue, uh, American English dialogue. He died, uh, sad to say, in 2013 at the age of 87. He left behind more than 50 novels. Uh, they're all good. Uh, at least I, I think I've read almost all of them and I've never read one I didn't like. Uh, after his death, Terry Gross, uh, uh, NPR's Fresh Air host, ran excerpts from two of the interviews she had done with him uh, in earlier years. That's something she does often when an author dies. And she was uh, keen to, to get him to talk about the extent to which the things he wrote about reflected experience he had had himself in his own life. And one thing his novels were known for were the snappy comebacks of his characters. Uh, if if uh, somebody was in a, a tight spot, they'd think of some uh, really clever thing to say. Uh, was that something he could do in his life, she wanted to know. Oh, no, he, he demurred. He, he was not good at that at all. He said, when you're writing, it's different. You've got six months to think about it. You, you know, a set, snappy comeback in the, on the written page might have taken all of six months to craft into the form you see. Uh, and that's not at all like the skill required to be able to come up with that in, a, in real time in a conversation. So no, he wasn't any, any good at that at all. Well, did he ever regret not being able to come up with a snappy comeback? She wanted to know. And he didn't want to talk about that either. But finally, she got him to open up about that. And here I tried to transcribe uh, the MP3 file faithfully. Uh, he says, well, maybe you need to know his background. In Aspen, if you ski there, you can ski right down into the, the town. The, the, some of the slopes go into the city, and you can ski into the city and, and sit on a bench right in the, in the it, edge of the commercial district. Uh, he says, in real life, I'm sitting on a bench in Aspen, 4 o'clock in the afternoon, dead tired. I've come down the mountain. And a woman skis down, 25, 30 years younger than I am, and puts one boot up on the bench and says, I don't know what's more satisfying. Taking off my boots? Or? And then she used an expression for sleeping with somebody. And you can tell Terry Gross uh, is, is shocked by, by this revelation. She gasps audibly. And, she, and you said? Uh, and I said, huh, er, uh, and that was probably 15 years ago, adding that he'd been trying ever since that day, without success, to come up with even a decent comeback line, never mind a snappy one. Uh, so no, he wasn't, he wasn't good at that himself. Uh, and it doesn't matter if you're good at that. Most of the time, uh, you know, you're, that's not how we're rewarded in this life. Most of the time, coming up with snappy comeback lines, but sometimes it's nice to have that skill. Let me show you an episode where I wished I'd had more of it. I had been writing about the influence of chance events in the labor market based on some experiences that had interested me in that subject. And one Monday after a, a, one of my Sunday New York Times columns was published, I got a call from Fox Business News. They wanted to know if I'd come on and talk to their host, Stuart Varney, uh, about my column. Uh, I was not born yesterday. I knew this was not going to be a friendly interview. Uh, I thought, well, all right, I'll do it. Uh, I've got some interesting things to tell the viewers about. Maybe they'll 
they'll pause and think a little bit based on what I can tell them. Sure, I'll do it. Let me play you a few minutes from our conversation. Success to economic success. Hard work, talent, determination? No, not so, says Cornell University professor Robert Brown. He's smiling, he's sitting next to me. <laughs> Many parents tell their children talent and hard work are neither necessary nor sufficient that for economic success. He says success has a lot to do with luck. And he's joining us right now this week. Professor, wait, do you know how insulting that was? When I read that, I came to America nothing 35 years ago. I've made something of myself. I think through hard work, talent, and risk taking. And you're going to write in the New York Times that this is luck. No, I didn't say that in the New York Times. What I said actually is that if you have lots of talent and you work very hard, you're still probably not going to be a big success. There's also a big element of luck. But it's, I, I know, I'm taking the other side of the coin, which is you said that you need luck, and luck is part of being wealthy and successful. You are downturning, downplaying hard work, talent, brains, drive, and ability. You are, in fact, taking on the American dream. You are saying that the American dream is not really there. No, I don't believe I'm saying that, Stuart. Say respectfully, consider the possibility that you were very lucky. You do uh, a lot of hard work, I'm sure. You started with not much, but you're very lucky to have ended up successful. And a lot of people who work hard and are, are just as talented. Wait a minute, have you successful? Am I lucky or not? Yes. yes. Who I am and where I am. Yeah, so am I. That's outrageous. That is outrageous. What about the risk I took? Do you know what risk is involved in coming to America with absolutely nothing? Do you know what risk is involved in trying to work for a major American uh, network with a British accent? A total star? <laughs> risk is implied for this level of success? I do. Is it wrong? <laughs> So it, so it went on and on like that for another six minutes. It was, it was very unpleasant. Uh, I, I, I got in the cab outside the studio, and immediately uh, it, it was obvious to me all the opportunities I had missed uh, during the conversation. He said, I came to this country with nothing. I had looked him up on the web the night before I went down for the interview. He was a graduate of the London School of Economics. <laughs> that's, that's not a Cornell degree, but it's, it's, it's not uh, nothing either. It's a pretty good credential to have uh, in the US labor market, all things considered. Did I know how hard it was to make it in television with a British accent? You don't know who this is. I'll tell you, it's Frank H.T. Rhodes. You do know who it is? I was just wondering if you ended up having a conversation with him off air. He was an asshole. Uh, <laughs> he, he was just what he seemed like, uh, I thought. <laughs> Frank Rhodes was the president of Cornell for most of the early years I taught here. Uh, he had been born in England, educated in England. He came to the U.S. as a young academic. He was a geology professor at the University of Michigan at the start of his career. He then moved here and became our, our president, where he served for a long time very successfully. And the British accent was a big part of the act. Uh, when he would speak to the alumni, you could just tell they loved the Ox Oxbridge pronunciation of all the, the, the stuff he was telling them. And it turned out I met one of his colleagues from the early days at Michigan. He said, you know, the interesting thing is when Frank Rhodes first came here, his British accent wasn't very strong. Uh, it's much stronger now than it was at first. And the linguists say, yeah, no wonder, because the British accent is actually quite advantageous uh, socially in this setting. If you come from a place whose accent is not advantageous, that accent tends to fade over time. If it's an advantageous accent, accent, it gets stronger over time, as his apparently had done. So poor 
it, it, <laughs> Fox News host, British accent. But the, but the main thing I, I whiffed on was, he said, do you know what risks I took? And I thought about that, and I thought, oh, I didn't say anything when he said that. You take a risk. What does that mean? That means, look it up. It means uh, bad things could happen. Uh, the outcome isn't certain. You took a risk. Things turn out well. You were lucky by definition. Why didn't I say that? Uh, because I didn't think of it. Uh, I wished I had thought of it. I was embarrassed not to have thought of it. Friends of mine sent me emails that that very evening saying, why didn't you say if he took a risk, he was lucky if he succeeded? Because I didn't think of it was the answer. <laughs> so all right, a couple of days go by. I'm feeling low about uh, not having done better. But then you, you pick yourself up, and you dust yourself off, and you move forward. It's no big deal. That would be my advice to you if you ever have an experience like I had. Uh, don't dwell on it forever. But it doesn't mean that you wouldn't want to try to at least cultivate the, the skill of thinking more quickly on your feet, because sometimes it really matters whether you can do it. I'll describe one vivid episode from my own experience. I was windsurfing. It was a fluky day. Windsurfers uh, often use a harness. It's, a, it's a, either a vest or a belt. It has a hook on it. It hooks through a rope. The rope is attached to the boom. Uh, and the, the point of it is that your body weight does most of the work when you lean back to keep the, the mast upright and the sail upright. If you don't use one of these, then your hands and arms get tired quickly, and you can only, only uh, stay out for about an hour or two. With one of these, you can stay out all day and, and have fun. So I'm out there. It's, a, it's the most unusual weather pattern I'd ever tried to sail in. It was anywhere from dead calm one moment to 40 miles an hour gale the next. It was just uh, completely unpredictable. At one point, the wind died, and I started to fall over backwards. Uh, and then in swept a, uh, the biggest gust of the whole day, uh, who knows how many miles per hour. But it flipped me over the boom and mast. I did a twist in the air. I landed violently. I wasn't knocked out, but when I uh, figured out what had happened, I was under the sail. And there was no air between me and the, the, the sail. I was underwater. Uh, and I, I realized that I had to get out from under there, because it, not to do that would mean dying from lack of air. So I said, all right, I'll just pull. I'll pull the rope off the hook, and I'll swim out from under the sail. So I tried to do that. My, my hook had a little nipple on the end of it. This one here doesn't have, have one of those. And that's to keep the rope from coming off the sail easily. The fact that I had done the twist meant that it was wrapped around really tightly. So I tried to coax it over that uh, end. I couldn't get it to come off. So that, that seemed dangerous to me. Uh, I, I thought uh, I better go to plan B, and I started pushing up as hard as I could on the sail, hoping to get some air to uh, force under it. Nothing happened when I did that. This cannot be a suspenseful story, really, because here I am. Uh, <laughs> but it was suspenseful to me as it was occurring in real time. I went back to the rope, and I tried to get the, the rope to come off again. No, no luck there. I, I pushed hard on the sail again. No luck there. A third time on the rope, I thought, well, maybe I'll, I'll make headway this time. No, nothing. So I was really about out of air, and I was thinking, this is my last chance. And I pushed as hard as I could on the sail, and this magnificent sucking sound occurred. There was air under the sail. And I kicked to the surface, and I breathed in deeply and calmed down and thought, what do I do now? I've got to get out uh, from under the sail still. And then I thought, of what I should do, which is what I should have thought to do right at the outset. I unzipped my vest, and I took it off, and I swam out from under the sail. Why didn't I think of that? I don't know. I just didn't. Uh, stupid. Uh, but sometimes, if you don't think quickly, it's really bad for you. Uh, and so uh, if you can think of exercises that would help you be alert and think quickly on, the, on your feet, don't assume that all it will cost you is a little embarrassment if you don't 
do that. It might cost you more than that sometimes. I was lucky. I counted myself lucky that day. I thought that by, by all odds, uh, I, I ought to have drowned on that occasion. Uh, it was just pure dumb luck that the air came on the third push. <coughs> This is my friend and collaborator, Tom Gilovich. I talk, talked to you briefly about his work earlier. He and I were playing tennis about a decade ago uh, at the East Lake Tennis Center. That's about five or six miles north of town on the east shore of Cuga Lake. Uh, he tells me that during the second set, I complained to him I was feeling nauseated. And he says the next thing he knew, I had tumbled off the bench and I was lying motionless on the court. He knelt to investigate. He discovered that I was not breathing. I had no pulse. Uh, he thought emergency, and he called out for somebody to dial 911. Then he flipped me over onto my back and started pounding on my chest. He had never been trained to do that, as I'm guessing most of you never have been. I have never been. Uh, he had seen it done on TV. That's all you need uh, to get started. He, he also had talked to a former Israeli graduate student of his who had been in the military who'd, who had told him that if you are doing CPR and you don't break the victim's breastbone, you weren't trying hard enough. And so he said he had that in mind and he was working very hard. to. And he said, nothing. He, he pounded and pounded, nothing. Finally, he got a weak cough out of me uh, after what seemed like forever. And then I died again. And he was about to give up. Uh, and in through the door of the facility comes the EMTs. They've got their uh, equipment in tow. They cut my shirt off me. They put the paddles on me. They load me onto the gurney and take me to the hospital there. They put me on a helicopter and fly me to a big hospital in Pennsylvania. They put me on ice overnight. Uh, four days later uh, is the first memory I have of any of that. The doctor is explaining to me that I had suffered an episode of sudden cardiac death. He says, if that happens to you uh, and you're not uh, revived right away, 98% uh, of, of, of people who experience that uh, never come back to consciousness. They, they stay dead. I was dead. It's also called sudden cardiac arrest. I like the other term better. It's more dramatic. Uh, you, get, oh, you must not have really been dead. There he is still. Uh, no, you're dead. And the question is, do you stay dead? Uh, that's maybe a philosophical question, but, but it's, it's in no doubt that it's a pretty serious thing to have happen. And he said that if you don't get uh, revived pretty quickly, you're not going to make it. 98% of the people who experience this don't make it. The 2% who make it, he says, you don't want to see most of them. They're all kind of messed up. They've been without oxygen for extended periods. They're, they're messed up. And uh, I was messed up. Uh, my family tells me the first uh, several days in the hospital, I was talking nonstop gibberish. You know, they couldn't have a, a, a coherent conversation with me at all. Then on day four, I wake up and I'm fine. I seem normal. What happened? Uh, they're, they're explaining all this to me. Uh, they don't know. Uh, so, you know, your computer f freezes. Turn it off and, and turn it back on again. Maybe that'll help. Uh, they, they, don't know, they don't know how it works, really. Uh, it works in, a, in strange ways. But if I hadn't gotten the help I got when I got it, I, I wouldn't be here, obviously. And the amazing thing about getting the help was that it came fairly quickly. And even though we were in a location where it would have normally taken 25 or 30 minutes to dispatch an ambulance, how did it get there quickly enough to matter for me? The answer is interesting. It's why I tell you the story. It's because there had been two auto accidents that had occurred right near the tennis facility shortly before I went down. And one of them wasn't serious. And so when the call came in about me, they were able to dispatch that second ambulance to come to me. If, except for that, I'm not here. I was lucky. Pure, dumb luck. Different cultures think about that sort of episode differently. My mother would have thought I was destined to survive. Uh, OK. Uh, I don't think about it that way. I think, wow, 
just a remotely likely event happened, and I'm here, and, and I'm grateful for that. I'll tell you about uh, a more prosaic set of circumstances that play out less, less dramatically, obviously, in the labor market. Uh, again, in my own personal case, I was on the job market as a fourth year graduate student at Berkeley. I got on the plane uh, in December to fly to New Orleans where the AEA meetings were, the place where candidates go for their job interviews. And I was sick as a dog. I had a fever of about 103 or 104. I went to New Orleans. I went through my interviews. I'm sure I was just the least impressive candidate anybody had talked to all day long. And I left thinking, wow, no chance for me. Uh, but then I got a call to go to, to what I'll call a, a, a a little known school in flyover country. Uh, they wanted me to come and give a talk. So, okay, yeah, I don't, I'm not gonna have any other opportunities. It wouldn't be the kind of place that a graduate student from Berkeley would wanna go, but, but sure, yeah, what, what are my choices? I went, I came back, I, I gave my talk. They called me a couple of days later, we wanna give you a job. Okay, so I didn't strike out. Then I went to Cornell. They had called two, uh, and I had one other call from University of Wisconsin. Those were two very good economics departments. So I thought, well, if I could land a job at one of those, that would be, uh, I, I would end up paying no penalty for having been sick uh, during my inter interviews. I'd be lucky. So I went to Cornell. I gave my talk. Uh, I got a call back. I thought Ithaca was fabulous. It was January. It was all covered with ice. It was beautiful. It was unlike any place I'd ever seen. Wouldn't it be great to go there? Great university, great location, great place to raise kids. Uh, so I got a call, again, three or four days after I visited. We want to give you an offer uh, to come to Cornell. Wow, uh, unbelievable. Uh, and so I said, can I let you know after Saturday, I'm going to Wisconsin to give a talk there. I'm scheduled. No, he said. No, no, the offer expires in three days. Take it or leave it. I said, I'll take it. Uh, and, and so uh, I came. The next year, I met uh, the, the faculty in the department. I was uh, originally appointed in the econ department. And one of the second year assistant professors said that he had seconded the motion that I get the offer I got. And the department chairman was so angry that he seconded the motion. He, he threw a piece of chalk at him from across the room where he was sitting. He apparently favored some other candidate for the, the offer. I have kept track of that other candidate over the years, and I feel a certain satisfaction in, in noting that I've done better than he has uh, <laughs> over the years. But the, the really interesting thing about uh, what I, I was told by that young professor was that I had been the seventh hire uh, that year. The department had never hired seven people before. They'd never hired more than three, I don't think, before that or, or since. And so how many offers did they give? Probably nine or ten before they got the, the seventh one filled. Uh, that means that in normal circumstances, I would not have gotten an offer from Cornell. I would uh, probably, therefore, not have gotten an offer from Wisconsin either because Cornell was a better department. I mean, uh, Wisconsin was a better department than Cornell's at that time. And if Cornell wouldn't have given me an offer uh, before they'd hired at least six people, then Wisconsin, which I, I don't know how many they were hiring, but there are hardly any departments ever hiring more than a couple, I wouldn't have gotten an offer there either. And I would have gone to that uh, nondescript outpost in flyover country. And that would have been where, where I, I'd have ended up. You can say, well, you'd, you work hard and you advance. That doesn't happen. Uh, you usually get mired wherever you go. And they wouldn't have expected much from me. They didn't really demand that uh, candidates do a lot of research to keep their jobs and get promoted. Uh, and I'm basically lazy uh, by temperament. If somebody doesn't demand a lot from me, I can deliver on that. You, know. <laughs> you, you want somebody who's not going to work too hard? I can do that. Uh, I would have adjusted. I would have figured out a way to, to make a life for myself under those circumstances, but it would have been very different from the start I got here. 
although I didn't make much of the start I got here. I got separated from my wife in year uh, 14 months after being here. I was caring uh, for our two small kids by myself. Uh, she moved to Washington because she had a good job offer down there. Uh, I had to come home at 2 o'clock in the afternoon, 2.30, to pick them up at daycare. I didn't write anything. I had one published paper that I'd written in graduate school. I had nothing in the pipeline. Today, they fire people whose records look like that with probability one when the third year review occurs. They say, this guy's going nowhere. Get rid of him. Get somebody in there who can do the job. There had been zero hope for me any time in the last 15 years or so. Uh, it was maybe a little bit more lax then. Moreover, I was doing a good job in the introductory course. That was 400 students in, a, in an auditorium. They have a hard time staffing that course without a lot of complaints. I'm sure their posture toward me was, let's exploit him for another three years and then fire him. That was their plan. Uh, so they kept me on. I was lucky they kept me on because, as it turned out, things started to break for me after that. I was trying to find a picture of myself from that era. I couldn't. That was a, a, a passport photo from some time back in those days. Uh, what was life like then? Uh, I was trying to, th <laughs> I was trying to th think of well, what can I do? I, I, nobody was showing any interest in my work. I, 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 I was busy with other things. I couldn't really get a lot of work done. Then in year four, this guy came, Edward M. Gramlich, Ned Gramlich, a very sweet man, a very accomplished policy economist. He took an interest in my work. Who, who would have thunk? Uh, Nobody in the department had taken any interest in my work until he arrived. He, he thought that I was interesting. He liked to talk to me about economic ideas. We would go skiing together and talk about economics on the lifts when we would ride, ride up. Uh, he invited me after a, a while to write a paper for a volume he was editing. You shouldn't do that normally if you're an assistant professor. Don't publish a paper in an edited volume. Why? Because nobody reads those volumes. Publish it in a peer-reviewed journal. I didn't have anything published, though. So I thought, at least this is a sure thing. I'll do it. I worked hard on the paper. I gave it to him. He said, I'll get back to you in a couple of days. Uh, he came back uh, after a couple of days, knocked on my door with a hangdog look. He said, the volume has been canceled. The editor had just called him to say they weren't going to do it after all. I worked so hard on that paper, and now it's not going to even be published. Uh, I thought, terrible uh, twist of, of, of fate that they, somebody decided not to do that. But then, on a lark, I sent it to Econometrica. Econometrica is probably the most selective uh, technical journal in economics. If, if you wanted to send a signal to the world that you were good, there's no place to publish a paper that would be more effective than publishing it there. There are a lot of bad papers published there, so it's not clear evidence that you're good, but it's really hard to get papers published there. And uh, I didn't expect mine to get published there. I thought, what, they all send it there. Six weeks later, I get back a letter from the editor, we want to publish your paper with no revisions. I couldn't believe it. Uh, I, I knew better than to expect an outcome like that, so I said, OK, you can publish my paper. Uh, of course you can publish it. Uh, and there was a simple extension of that paper that I thought I could do in, in short order. I did that. I sent it to another leading journal. And it came back in, in under two months' time. We'd like to publish your paper with no revisions. I went to Germany that summer. I wrote three papers while I was in Germany. I remember sitting there on the bed in my uh, apartment off the Kudam with a yellow pad, sort of, sort of scratching out ideas. I gave them those uh, uh, worn pages to the assistant when I got back. She typed it all up. I sent it to three different journals. Bang, bang, bang. They came back. We want to publish your paper. No demands for rev revisions at all. Uh, first round, accept. Uh, that has never happened to me in all the years since then. Those weren't bad papers. You know, I work, worked uh, assiduously on them, but I've published many papers that were better than those papers. None of them has ever been accepted on the first try. None of them. Some of them have been re rejected two, three, four times before I said, 
the hell with it and put it back in the drawer and didn't send it out anymore. If it gets accepted, it's usually with requests for revisions. That takes eight months usually to get the first report back, then another eight months to, to, for them to evaluate the revision. If anything like the usual timetable had occurred for the papers I submitted during my second three years at Cornell, I would never have had a chance to get promoted here. They assembled a, a, a file of reviewers who are known to be critical. A, a senior colleague told me about this later. I think that it was their hope to fire me. But the, the record I had assembled was better than the record of the other people they had hired that year, the, the other six. And so I think they thought, well, if we want to fire him, we've got to fire all, all six of the others, and, and we'd never get away with, with a personnel move like that. Uh, and so they promoted me. They held their nose, and they promoted me. Uh, but it was pure dumb luck that I got promoted at Cornell. If I hadn't gotten promoted at Cornell, my life would have been very, very different. I would have been at some place where I wouldn't have been able to uh, interact with good students and good colleagues. I wouldn't have gotten invited to stimulating conferences. I wouldn't have gotten grants from the National Science Foundation to do research. I wouldn't have gotten invited to spend a week with the Dalai Lama in India to talk to him about a book he was preparing. I wouldn't have gotten invited to write a New York Times column. Oh, I got to do so many wonderful, cool things. But all of that was just a consequence of a string of wildly improbable happenings in the labor market. And so for me, uh, it, is luck important? Uh, I'm not stupid. I'm not the smartest guy uh, out there, but I'm not stupid. If I didn't notice how important luck is, then uh, I wouldn't be able to do anything at all that demanded any serious thought. Uh, yeah, I've been hit over the head multiple times by how important luck is. So, of course, I noticed it, but most people don't notice it. Most people don't notice it. I'll skip this next one. When something spectacular happens, they do notice it. Here's uh, Mike Edwards in the bow tie. He was the cellist in the original group that formed ELO. Does anybody know who ELO is anymore? All right, Electric Light Orchestra. Yeah, they're, they're, they, were, they were players back in the day. He was no longer performing. He was teaching cello lessons in rural England, driving along a rural roadway in his van. At the top of the hillside, there had been a, a 1,300 pound bale of hay tethered. It broke loose from its moorings. It tumbled down the hill. It picked up speed. It hit a berm. It jumped a tall fence and landed right on top of his van. It killed him instantly. We all are able to recognize he was unlucky to have been in that spot at that time. He was not destined to die in that way, I don't believe. Some people believe that. I don't believe that. He was unlucky. His number came up. He was unlucky. We don't agonize about using luck to describe outcomes like that. Somebody wins the lottery. They're lucky. Most of us think they're lucky. Does anybody think skill is involved in winning the lottery? The lottery winners themselves seem to think skill plays a role. What, <laughs> One, one of the, my favorite examples in doing research for my project was in a book by Michael Mobison called The Success Equation. He came across a guy in Spain who wanted to buy a lottery ticket ending in the number 48. He had to look all over the country. He advertised in the classifieds and, and uh, scoured uh, all around. Finally, somebody stepped up. I've got one. Uh, you want to buy it? And they charged him a steep premium for it. He paid the premium, he, he held the ticket, and he won. Of course, the media went wild. Uh, how did you know 48 was going to win? Uh, and he explained. He said, I had a dream seven nights in a row. I dreamed, on each of those nights, I dreamed of the number seven. And since 7 times 7 is 48, I knew I had to buy a lottery ticket that ends in 48. Of course, 7 times 7 is not 48. It's 49. 
So you want an example of the purest form of pure dumb luck? That's the best one I, I've got. The sociologist uh, Paul Lazarsfeld uh, gave us the term hindsight bias. This helps us understand why people tend to overlook the role of luck in life. It's we see something happen, we think we can invent a cogent explanation for it, and then we're done. We, we, we don't try to imagine whether things could have turned out differently. We see how it happened, we invent an explanation, we're finished. He illustrated the concept with an experiment. He asked subjects uh, to, to consider a study that had been done. It was one uh, that had taken several years and it cost a lot of money. They wanted to find out, the study authors wanted to find out whether it was uh, young men who'd grown up on farms or young men who'd grown up in cities who were better able to adjust to the rigors of military life. Who did better? And he said that uh, after many years and much expense, the study authors were able to say conclusively that it was the young men who'd grown up on farms that did better. And subjects in the experiment responded just as he knew they would. They said, many of them, why do you need to do an expensive study to learn that? It's obvious that people who grew up on farms would do better in military life. Of course, the twist was that there had been a study done, and it was the city kids who did better adjusting to military life by a significant margin. Imagine you had been a participant in that survey, uh, and you heard that it was city kids who had done better in military life. You could construct a narrative that made that seem like, of course, they would do better. But if you'd heard rural kids, you'd have a story for that, too. And the point is that life is complicated. It occurs in thousands of tiny steps. Each one depends on the ones that came before. Each one influences the ones that come afterwards. And if any one of them had been different, even in a minor way, the course shifts a bit. And since it's all cumulative, the, the place you end up is dramatically different, often from where you would have ended up had it not been for a small shift. Think about the images you'll see if you go home tonight and do an, uh, a Google search on the term headwinds and then click, click the image link, you'll see images like these. What do you think of when you see an image like, these guys are battling headwinds. It's tough. They're, they're, they've got a fight to make headway. <clears throat> Tom Gilovich, the same friend uh, who, who was playing tennis with me uh, long ago, has done work on headwinds and tailwinds. He says, Google tailwinds and see what you get. Click the image link that, on that term. You get gobbledygook. There's no convenient way to represent the concept of a tailwind diagrammatically or with a picture. Uh, it's, it's much more difficult. And he says, it's completely asymmetric the way we think about headwinds and tailwinds as they affect us in life. Here I'll quote from a talk that he gave. If any of you go running or ride a bike, you'll know that when you're running or bicycling into the wind, you're very aware of it. You just can't wait till the course turns around and you've got the wind at your back. When that happens, you feel great. But then you forget about it very quickly. You're just not aware of the wind at your back. And that's just the fundamental asymmetry between obstacles and things that help you along. You're aware of the obstacles you confront. You have to actively battle against them. Something's helping you along. Why should you notice that? You don't have to do anything. It's helping you along. People who are asked uh, whether their opponent got better letter letters than they did in a game like Scrabble almost invariably say, yeah, their opponent got better letters than I did. But that's not true over the long haul, uh, it, just that you remember when you got the crappy letters and they got the good ones. You don't remember the times you had the good letters. I had an argument with my editor about uh, this issue. I wanted to call Breaking Bad, the, the television drama, the greatest television dramatic series of all time. He said, no, you can't call it that. He thought that was too extreme. We compromised. I ended up calling it one of the greatest television dramas of all time. It doesn't matter for the purposes of the example. It was a huge success, but it had uh, 
some rough moments as it was attempting to get off the ground. Vince Gilligan, the, the show creator, wanted to cast Brian Cranston in the role of Walter White, the, the uh, cancer-ridden high school chemistry teacher who was looking for a way to create a financial legacy for his family after he died. Uh, he thought, well, if I can make and sell meth, that's big money. I'll be able to leave them uh, able to get through the next years after I'm gone. And so the whole drama is built around that. The show's studio producers didn't want uh, Cranston to play the role of Walter White. Why? Because he, was, he had never had a major dramatic role before. Uh, he, he was known best for a role in a sitcom. He was the dad in Malcolm in the Middle. So Walter White, the dad, Malcolm in the Middle, it, that's, not a, that's not a good fit. Uh, Gilligan had seen him in a clip from the X-Files 15 years earlier and thought, yeah, that's Walter White. Uh, but he couldn't convince the studio bosses to, to cast uh, Cranston in the, ro in the role. Uh, they made him offer the role instead to Matthew Broderick. Think about that. Matthew Broderick, <laughs> Walter White? No way that would have worked. Uh, uh, but as it turned out, Broderick said no. He couldn't do it or he didn't want to do it. So then they made him offer it to John Cusack. That works better for me. Uh, I can imagine Cusack being a success in the role. But Cusack turned it down, or at least he didn't accept it. He denies having turned it down. He doesn't deny it having been offered it. What, so what did he do then if he didn't turn it down? I don't know. Uh, and only then was uh, Gilligan able to persuade uh, the bosses to let him offer the role to Cranston. And the rest is history. The show won Emmys every year for Best Dramatic Series. Uh, the Walter White character portrayed by Cranston won the Best Dramatic Actor Emmy four out of the five seasons. Cranston is now the most sought after actor in his demographic. Everybody wants him in their movie. But as he's the first to recognize, if he hadn't gotten his break to have been cast in this role, he'd still be doing the same low level stuff he was doing up until then. He was in his 50s. He was not going to break out. Uh, with high probability in some other role. This was his chance, and he was lucky to get it, as he's the first one to say. <clears throat> My wife is a good athlete. Uh, she didn't know she was a good athlete because the athlete slot in her family had already been claimed by one of her older sisters. Uh, she's the fifth of six kids. She got the artist musicians slot. She didn't get any lessons in sports or go to any sports camps. She went to music and, and art camps. As an adult, uh, she said, teach me to water ski. I've taught over 100 people to water ski. I grew up in Florida. Uh, it's a standard uh, drill. You learn to ski on, on two skis. Then if you're ambitious, you want to learn to ski on one, the traditional trajectory is you get up on two, you kick one ski off, you try to hold your balance, you fall a bunch of times. When you get really good at keeping your balance on one ski that way, then you try the hard part, the really hard part, which is to get pulled out of the water on one ski. I've taught gifted athletes to do this lots and lots of times, and nobody's ever done it except by failing 15 or 20 times before getting up for the first time. She got up the very first time she tried it. I've never seen that happen. She didn't know she was any good at sports. She didn't know. Why? Because that spot was taken in the sibling ordering. It's random whether there's a spot for you when you come along. If you're in one environment, maybe the spot that's still left for you is the right one for you. Actually, the music and art spot was a good spot for her. But it might not have been. Uh, Maybe, maybe this would have been her one chance to make a difference in life, and she would have missed it because that spot was already taken. You know who these people are? None of you will say, oh, that can't be right, if I say that this woman is famous just for being famous. Does anybody have the reaction, oh, no, that's, that's, that's wrong? I, I'm, I'd, be, I'd, love, I'd love to hear what you have to say about that. What she ever done to be famous? that we ought to recognize and, and write more column inches 
about her than any, any other woman in the country? You can't answer that question. She's just famous because other people have taken an interest in her, and because they've taken an interest in her, other people take an interest in her too. It's a, it's a fluke. <laughs> what about her? She's famous for being famous too. <laughs> there, there will be art historians who get angry if I say that, but having read Duncan Watts, the sociologist on this subject, I think it's a compelling argument that she's famous for being famous. It's a painting by Leonardo, one of the great masters. So, so that gives it a certain stature right out of the gate. But he did thousands of paintings. Why this one? Uh, nobody had much to say about it for the first few hundred years of its existence. It was stolen on an August day, August 11th, uh, or, or uh, an August day in 1911 by Vincent. Chenzo Perugia, a custodian at the Louvre who tucked it under his cloak one night when he was leaving. He stole it. And that was at a time when newspapers were, for the very first time in history, able to reproduce photographs on their pages. And so when the theft occurred, it was a, a, a sensation around the world. It was reported in newspapers all around the globe, pictures of the Mona Lisa displayed on the front pages of, of, of newspapers. Uh, a, 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 a terrible uh, loss for the museum to have one, one of its grand master's works taken in the, in the dead of night. Have you gone to see it, any of you? Uh, what happens when you go there? Uh, it, you can't get near it, for one thing. If people are elbow to elbow in the gallery trying to get closer to see it, you want to do the thing they tell you, which is to walk by and see if her eyes really follow you when you walk by. They didn't when I did it. Did, they, did that work for you? It didn't work for me. Uh, two years after the theft, they caught Perugia. He was trying to repatriate the painting to Italy, tried to sell it to the directory of the Uffizi Gallery in Florence. He thought it belonged there. It had been p painted by an Italian after all. But the Uffizi director turned him into the police. And again, there was this massive explosion of publicity pages uh, of newspapers, uh, all, all carrying vivid photos of the painting. And since then, it's been the most famous painting in the world. It's the symbol of Western art and culture everywhere. But it's just famous for being famous. The art historians, Watts writes, trying to say it's famous because it has qualities X, Y, and Z, objective qualities. But really, those qualities are just, in effect, that it looks more like the Mona Lisa than any other painting. Uh, there's nothing there. There's no there there. Uh, you can g gain further confidence in that hypothesis by going to visit the, the two paintings in the adjacent gallery. They're also Leonardo's, or at least they were when I went. They're painted by Leonardo at the same uh, era. They're, they had the same novel brush strokes as the Mona Lisa. Nobody gives a damn about those paintings. They're, the galleries are empty. Nobody's trying to crowd close to see them uh, because they're not famous. Watts did experiments to demonstrate th this effect. How does this effect work? Well, uh, let's see in the music industry what determines which songs succeed and which ones don't. He put 48 indie bands on a website with 48 songs, one for each band, and said, download these songs if you want. All you have to do is give them a rating, a number between 1 and 10, indicating how much you like them. And people did that, and those were his objective quality ratings. That's how he knew how people felt about the songs. Most of the songs had mixed ratings. Some people liked them, others didn't. There was a range in between. A few songs most people liked. Uh, a similarly small number most people didn't like. But most were variable in terms of people's reactions to them. What he did then was put the 48 bands on eight different websites, the band name, the song name, same as before, but this time two more pieces of information. The number of times the song had been downloaded thus far and what ranking did it have on average thus far. That's, that, those were the only two additional pieces of information he supplied. Let me. Uh, play you a few bars from 
52 metros locked down. Does anybody know this band? like that song. <laughs> if, if I had downloaded that song uh, and I'd been the first one to, to listen to it, I would have given it a zero. Uh, and if I had to make a prediction, how's it going to rank among the 48? I'd say 48. Uh, is there, could there be a worse song than that? I would ask myself. But no, that's not how everybody reacts to it. Some people really liked it. And so this song, which was about in the middle, 26 out of 48 on the objective ratings, ended up first on one of the websites. People liked it better than any of the other songs. And it was 40th on another one of the websites. So if somebody who likes it happens to be the first one to download it, and he gives it a good rating, you're off and running. If somebody who downloads it first didn't like it, you're screwed. The song goes off into the, the toilet. Uh, it's just a question of the luck of the draw. Who is your first reviewer? Uh, authors of books all claim, if only I'd gotten a sympathetic reviewer, uh, my book would have been a success. Uh, well, maybe, maybe not. But uh, that that could matter is beyond question. Are there some people so good that, that they would succeed no matter what? I would have said yes to that question. I had a very interesting dinner conversation with a record industry executive in New York who persuaded me that the Beatles succeeded only because of a combination of six or seven highly improbable things that happened. Uh, prominent among them was that George Martin, who wasn't even producing music albums at that time, uh, heard the demo tapes that they were circulating, which had been turned down by every record label up until then, he thought, well, maybe it might be fun to dabble in music. Uh, work, here's a group. I kind of like their son. I'll, I'll work with them. George Martin was a huge factor in the Beatles' uh, success. Uh, their, their gig in Hamburg, where they were able to play 10 hours uh, a day for, for a couple of months, where they really uh, went from being a really crappy band to a, a band that was inc incredibly tight and, and and well-focused, uh, most bands don't get an opportunity like that. And if any one of the, those half a dozen things hadn't happened, we'd have never heard of the Beatles, even though by objective measures, they're the most influential musical endeavor that's ever happened. Uh, how much did they influence the music scene? More than Beethoven, more than Bach, more than Mozart. And there's no one you can name that's even close to them, according to these sabermetric uh, tallies there's a lot of chance. It doesn't mean they weren't good. I mean, of course they were good. Uh, but there's a lot of people who are good who don't make it. In winner-take-all contests, we, we see that if there's a lot of contestants, here's a simulation that I did with 100,000 contestants. They drew their ability, effort, and luck from random distributions uh, uniformly distributed on the interval 0 to 100. And then their performance cons consisted of equal parts Ability and effort, 49% each, and luck, 2% was the weighting on luck. So what's your performance? 49% of my draw from the ability earn, 49% of my draw from the effort earn, 2% of my draw from the luck earn. Find the person who's got the highest uh, performance based on that weighted sum. <coughs> Find the person who's got the highest talent plus ability score. Uh, that's the most able person, the, the person who, in some sense, deserves to win the contest. That person is going to have only average luck. He's going to have only average luck. Why? Because he might have been lucky, he might have been unlucky. We didn't choose him for having good luck. We chose him because he had the highest score on the effort plus ability measure there will be hundreds of people who are almost as talented and work almost as hard as he does. They're right up against his neck in, the, in those distributions. And at least some of them will have been very lucky 
in the process. And that's all it takes for one of them to leapfrog over him. Here are the winners. The most commonly observed luck score in a contest where luck counted for only 2% was if you weren't between 95 and 100 on your luck score, you were not going to be a winner in that contest. People don't see the role of chance events in their lives very clearly. E.B. White, Cornell's most distinguished literary alum, wrote this in a, a, an essay published in the 1930s. Luck is not something you can mention in the presence of self-made men. They'll say, what do you mean, luck? I did it all on my own. That's what they'll say. Well, here's my cook when I was a Peace Corps volunteer in Nepal. He was really smart and really hardworking and, and just had a knack for doing anything I might invent to ask him to do. He could fix an alarm clock. He'd never done that before. He took it apart and got to work again. He could thatch a roof. He could plaster a wall. He could negotiate with the merchants in the bazaar without offending them. Uh, what, what couldn't he do? I never found anything he wasn't good at. And yet the high point in his lifetime earnings trajectory, I'm going to guess, was the pittance I was able to pay him when he was working for me. There were no institutions there that would enable somebody with that kind of talent to find an outlet that would be in any way suitable for what his skills were. The most disquieting piece of information turned up in my research was this. Here are the smart kids from the poor families. They're the ones who scored in the top of the math uh, standardized test distributions when they were in the ninth grade. That number reflects the probability that they would eventually graduate from college. Smart kids from poor families, 29%. Here are the dumb kids from wealthy families, kids who scored way at the bottom of the math test distribution. They were more likely to graduate from college. Nobody sees that, that difference as, yeah, that's the way we were hoping society would be. Uh, we were hoping the poor kids who were good would have a worse chance than the dumb rich kids. Uh, were you hoping that? Well, maybe if you're or from a, maybe if you're a dumb kid from a rich family, you were hoping that. What, so, yeah, what's the matter with that? Uh, uh, I, I don't, yeah, you see a problem in that? Uh, that's not the way most people look at this and say, yeah, that, that, that's the way we want society to be. My research assistant tried to tease out some of the forces at work in, in uh, people's assessments of their situations and whether they, they, they wanted to help... Uh, make the investments that are necessary to make to build the institutions that enable somebody like my cook to succeed. If he'd been born here, he'd be a success, almost certainly. He'd be still alive. I don't know if he's still alive, but he's past the normal life expectancy of men in Nepal. He's probably not still alive, I'm guessing. Bad luck that he wasn't born in circumstances that enabled him to take advantage of the, the talents he was born with. She told people in an online sample to name a good thing that had happened to them. Tell me a good thing that happened to you. And one group, she said, list three things external to you that contributed to it. And people, some of them mentioned luck explicitly. Others say they had a supportive partner, partner or they'd gotten financial aid. They'd gotten some, some form of help along the way. A second group, she said, list three things you did that made this good thing more likely to happen. Oh, I worked hard, I, I was assiduous, I, blah, blah, blah. A third group, she said, just tell me a good thing that happened to you, never mind why it happened. And then at the end, they got a bonus for completing the survey, and she told them, you can donate some part or all of your bonus to one of these charities if you wish to, or you can keep it all. Uh, the charities were Doctors Without Borders and two others. The group that were, was asked to name external causes for the event gave 25% more to the charities than the group that listed internal causes for the good thing happening. The control group fell roughly in the middle. Barack Obama tried to tackle this problem in 2012 with a speech he gave urging successful business owners to try to remember the social investments that had made it more likely that they would be able to succeed. So he said, 
uh, you, you've built a good business. Uh, you shipped your goods to market on roads the rest of us helped build. You hired workers the, the rest of us helped pay to educate. You were protected by police and firefighters that we hired to protect you. So good, you succeeded. Uh, you worked hard, you were talented, yes. Uh, but in the absence of the right circumstances, uh, it would have been much more difficult to succeed. And part of the social contract is that now that you have succeeded, you should recognize an obligation to pay forward so that the next group will have the same chance to succeed as you did. But we haven't been doing that. The people who have been successful have been more successful than at any time in the past, and they've used a lot of the money they've gotten to lobby for lower taxes, which has made it more difficult to make the investments that enable people to succeed. I graduated from college, a good college, with no debt. Uh, somebody like me would not be able to graduate from a school like I graduated from with no debt today. Is that a good thing? Uh, yeah, we could argue about that, but it's not obviously a good thing. There are investments that we should be making that most people say we should be making, but they're not willing to support because they think it would be too painful to pay more in tax. And what I want to conclude with is uh, just a, a, a closer look with how hard it would be if you're successful to pay higher taxes uh, and, and what might incline you to be willing to pay higher taxes. Uh, what we know is that telling people that they were successful in part because others helped is not necessarily a winning strategy. That's what Obama did. The speech he gave that day didn't sound controversial to me, but as it was portrayed to others, it became perhaps the most controversial speech of the whole season. People called it the you didn't build that speech. Oh, you built a business? Well, you didn't build that. Uh, it was not the you didn't build that speech. It was that uh, you didn't build that all by yourself speech. What businessmen heard was uh, Obama telling them, oh, you've been successful. Well, you don't deserve to be. You have a lofty position. You don't really merit that position. You lucked out. That was not the message of that speech. Uh, what we've learned, what I've learned, I've been studying this issue, is that it matters enormously how you have the conversation about the role of chance events in life. Ask a successful person whether he or she can recall examples of when Lady Luck smiled on him in his path to the top. If you ask that question, they don't get angry. They don't get defensive. It's amazing. Uh, they think it's an interesting question. Was I ever lucky? And they try to think of examples. And when they think of one, you can see their eyes light up. They want to tell you about it. They tell you about it, and that kindles the memory of a second example. They tell you about that, too. And then a third example. And before long, they're saying, why aren't we investing more in education? Uh, why aren't we building roads like we used to? Uh, all by themselves, they get to that. Uh, if you tell them they're lucky, they get angry. So don't tell people they're lucky. That's a mistake. Rhetorically, that's a mistake. I asked my psychotherapist friend who counsels uh, sexual abuse victims, what's going on here? She said it's the same thing she sees in her literature. If you tell a woman who's in an abusive relationship that she's in such a relationship, she gets defensive about it. She's more determined to stay than if you hadn't even had that conversation. Instead, she says, it's way more effective to say, tell me more about your relationship. And then that will elicit a detailed description of the relationship. And as that description spills out, the, the narrator realizes, oh my god, what am I doing in this relationship? I shouldn't be in this but. It's way more effective if the person discovers that on her own than if you tell her that. So don't tell people they've been lucky if you want to have this conversation. I think it's a good, I, I wrote the book primarily in the hope that people would have conversations about the role of luck in their lives. But they're not going to be successful conversations unless you can disarm that immediate tendency 
for successful people to think you're after them, that you're threatening them, that you're trying to steal their money or whatever it might be. Just tell me about your experience. We overestimate how hard it would be to pay the additional taxes that, that would be required to finance the investments that would give everybody a better chance to succeed. If you're successful, what do you want? You want the, th you want the things that are special. You want an apartment with a view of Central Park. You want a, a painting that uh, is in vogue. You want those things there aren't enough of. How do you get them? You have to bid against other people like you, and the high bidders are the ones who walk home with them. They're allocated almost completely on the basis of your relative pur purchasing power. So how are higher taxes going to affect me? When somebody thinks about that, they, they can't think back to when's the last time they raised my taxes, how did that feel? Because we haven't been raising people's taxes, we've been lowering them. So what's the next best heuristic to use? Well, there have been times when I've had less money in my life, uh, and if they raise my taxes, I'll have less money, I'll think back to those times, how did those times feel? And they felt bad. But the problem with that heuristic is that when I think of times when I had less money, when were those times? I got a divorce. Uh, my business had a bad year. I had a health problem. I had a home fire. I had a, a bad accident. I had less money. Everybody else had the same amount of money as before. And when I think of times like that, it really was harder for me to bid for what I wanted. But when we, that is to say, we successful people, all pay a little more in taxes, that's not what happens. We all have a little less to bid for these things we want, and the same people go home with them as before. People overestimate how hard it would be to make the investments that we would need to make. So let's do a thought experiment. We have a high-tax world and excuse me, a low-tax world and a high-tax world. In the high-tax world, we have enough money to make sure everybody gets to go to college who's capable of, of doing the work. In the low-tax world, it's, you gotta, you're on your own, basically. But the good news, in that world, you can afford a more expensive car than you can afford in this, in this world. You're stuck in this world having to drive a Porsche 911 Turbo. In this world, you get a Ferrari F12 Berlinetta, a 12-cylinder car with magnificent features. Well, what do we know about how that affects people's well-being? We know something about this. Suppose uh, I've got the answer in the envelope here. Who's happier, the rich guy driving that car in that society or the rich guy driving this car in this society? Everything else is equal in their private lives. What we know from the evidence is that they're going to be about equally happy. Why? Because this car has every feature that matters one whit for handling and performance already incorporated into it. If there were something else that would help it, they would have put it in there already. What do they, what do they get when you go here? You get some embellishments. Is it a better car? Uh, it's less reliable, for one thing. Uh, it's a smaller scale. It's my, maybe not even a better car. But suppose it's objectively, absolutely a little better. It's not much better, is the point. And my money would say that if we had a hedonometer, we could plug the rich people into it. In this society, we'd get the same reading on car satisfaction as we would get here. You could argue with that, but uh, it wouldn't be much different. But that's not the comparison that matters. The, these two societies will have different amounts of money to spend on public goods because the high tax society has more revenue and they'll spend part of it on maintaining the roads a little better. So here's the real question, who's happier? The guy driving his cheap Porsche on well-maintained roadways, roadways that are smooth and, and un unrippled, or the guy who's driving his Ferrari on roadways like the ones we drive on here, who's happier? Would anybody be willing to defend the claim that this guy is happier? It's an absurd claim to try to defend. It's false. 
you want a society, you need private goods, you need public goods. There's no society that doesn't have some mix of the two. The only question is, how much would, should we spend in each category? Here, we've decided on one mix. There are other possible mixes. Why might the rich people not vote higher taxes on themselves so they could move from here to the earlier? Because they overestimate how painful it would be to pay higher taxes. That's one hypothesis. Who knows what the reason is? OK, let me close with a, 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 a brief coda on my experience from 10 years ago. Uh, the neurologist who came to examine me before I got out of the hospital uh, came on day three and said, I'm going to give you a, 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 a list of three words I want you to remember. I'll ask you about them in a few, min in a few minutes from now. And so he said to me, uh, remember these words, hat, shoe, and pen. I'll come back to them. And then we talked for a while longer. Uh, I, I don't have any recollection of this, actually. My wife uh, told me about this, this session. Uh, he came back in five minutes uh, and said, now, what were the three words? And I said, huh? <laughs> he'd asked me, what, what do you mean, what were the three words? I had no idea he'd even asked me to remember three words. Uh, that was totally absent from my memory bank. The next day, I woke up, and I could do this. Who knows what happened? I don't know what happened. Uh, I rebooted uh, overnight uh, somehow. Thank goodness uh, I rebooted. But it became a running joke in our family. Huh. They asked him, uh, what were the three words? And he said, what three words? Uh, he couldn't even remember they'd been at. And so for Christmas, I opened one box, and inside it was, <laughs> was a hat, a Tilly hat. Nice. My wife had sculpted a little tennis shoe out of clay uh, and then brought me a nice cross pen, hat shoe pen. Ha, ha, ha. He couldn't even remember that. Be, so I had to go back for a follow-up checkup in January. This was all happening uh, in November and December. So I was quite nervous about it, actually. Uh, if you're an academic, you don't want to have a sign on your T-shirt saying, mentally defective. Uh, <laughs> that's that's counterproductive uh, to have a sign like that. I didn't want to be labeled as defective in some way. So I wasn't, wasn't sure uh, how it was going to turn out. We had to go down to Pennsylvania for this checkup. And so I said to my wife in the morning before we had to drive down there, give, give me a practice run. You know, give me three words. And she said, oh, don't be silly. I said, no, no, come on, I want, I want to practice. Give me three words. And she said, all right, tree, box, squirrel. And I said, OK, uh, let's keep talking. You come back, and you'll ask me about them. So I had to remind her, number one, to ask me about the three words. Must have been 10 minutes went by, and she hadn't remembered to do that. That's not unusual, actually. Uh, and then I said, uh, ask me about the words. She said, OK, what were they? And I said, do you remember them? And she had a panicky look on her face. <laughs> and she couldn't remember them. Uh, you should try this test. Uh, uh, it sounds easy, but it's not that easy. Uh, uh, it, it's, a, it's a test. Uh, and so she said, no, I, I can't remember what the th three words were. Uh, and I said, the three words were tree, box, squirrel. I said that triumphantly. I thought, ha, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm ready for this test. So we drove down there. In comes the same neurologist who had talked to me in November. He says, I'm going to give you three words. I'll come back to them later. All right, I was anticipating that. So he gives me three words. What were they? Hat, shoe, pen. Yeah. The same guy, the same three words. I looked at my wife, and she looked at me. We almost burst out laughing. We restrained uh, that reaction. Of course he was going to give the same three words. You know. He's got to remember them. How's he going to remember them? <laughs> so, so he says, all right, what were the three words? And I felt a moment of panic. Uh, I couldn't remember what the three words were. And then I remembered this scene uh, in front of the Christmas tree. And I said, hat, shoe, pen. Hat, shoe, pen, I said confidently. And he said, yeah, you're OK.
<laughs> and he signed his forms and he sent me out. And I figured, wow, uh, I dodged a bullet. Maybe I'm not OK, but I, I got through that test. Uh, if you're in the situation you are all in, you are indescribably lucky, indescribably lucky. You're smart. You're energetic. Uh, you, you got the ability to withstand a rough schedule. Not, not everyone can do that. Well, I deserve everything I got, you say, because you have those qualities. Where'd you get those qualities? We don't know exactly, except to say it's some combination of your genes and your environment. So I got these qualities from my genes and my environment. Which of those factors do you feel entitled to claim moral credit for? I'm smart, and I have an impulse to work hard. Good for you. You're lucky if you have those qualities. Uh, and if you remember that you're lucky, that would be good for you. You'll be happier. You'll be, you'll be more humble in your dealings with, with others. You'll be more generous towards others. Others will like you better. Uh, you'll sleep better. You'll have better health, fewer, fewer headaches, and other psychosomatic symptoms. Uh, so think about the role of chance in your own life. And, 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 and don't resist the idea that you've been lucky. Embrace it. You know, it's a good thing to embrace that idea. Thank you for your kind attention. I, I will meet you for the last time next time. <laughs>